I'm Taylor. And I'm Tyler. This is Scripture Central's Come Follow Me Insights. This week, Acts 6 through 9. As we jump into these chapters this week, perhaps a question for us to consider is how do we know when we're on the Lord's errand and seeking and recognizing and acting on His will? If you've, if you've struggled with that or questioned your own ability to receive revelation and, and follow it, this is an amazing set of chapters where we see example after example of people doing just that, having to move forward in faith, trusting in the Lord. So, we begin in chapter 6 with a little bit of a problem because the church has grown, and it's not an official church, it seems, at this point. It's, it's a gathering of disciples. They called themselves uh, the Way or the Saints. So this group of believers is growing so quickly that we find some problems arising. Here in verse 1 it says, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So the Grecians would probably be these Jews that have now joined the church or this, this group of believers from the diaspora, from out in the Greco-Roman Empire. They've now uh, been baptized and they're complaining against the Hebrews, which would be the Jewish Christians who are living in Palestine, in, in Israel. And the, the twelve apostles are saying, uh, what do we do about this? And what they say is, we need to find a way to organize that we can support the people in the church without disrupting the work of ministering and preaching the word of God. Now, the twelve can't do everything. They realize this. And so, they come up with a solution where they find honest and holy men, and they put them in charge of managing the growing affairs of the church so that the apostles can continue to be in prayer and in preaching and in teaching. So, you have this growth, and we see this in organizations everywhere. As things grow and change, you need to get more organization and you need to delegate different responsibilities to different people. That's right, because the apostles, their, their main mission is to be sent, that's what their word means, to be sent out rather than staying in Jerusalem to take care of these, these daily ministrations. It's beautiful that they pick these seven men as listed in verse 5. Now, the two in that list that Luke is going to give us some, some significant uh, airtime with are Stephen and Philip and the other five, we, we don't get a lot of their storyline. So let's begin with Stephen. Verse 8 tells us that Stephen was full of faith and, a, and great power. He did great wonders and miracles among the people. So he, he's got some gifts of the Spirit, he's, he's performing some of these wonders, and then verse 9 says there arose certain of the synagogue that uh, came and disputed with Stephen. So these would be leaders of the Jewish synagogue there at that place, and they're disputing with Stephen, but verse 10 says they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake, which now sets the stage for this incredible uh, trial that they're going to put Stephen on. They're going to call witnesses. Verse 12, they stir up the people, they caught him, they brought him to the council. Verse 13, they set up false witnesses. And then verse 15 says, all that sat in council looked steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. I, I find that interesting, Taylor, that here you have this man who has all of this, this capacity and power and authority from God. He's doing his work, and the, the enemies of the work have been stirred up and they're, they're calling false witnesses. They're speaking blasphemous things against him, and he's standing there and the people who are just watching say, wow, his face is as of an angel. Now, this should have been unmistakable to these individuals, that Moses also, his face shone like the face of an angel when he encountered God 
at Mount Sinai. And if we went back and talked to these Jews who were upset at Stephen, they'd say, oh yeah, Moses is our key prophet. He's the prophet that we want to listen to. So they should have recognized, oh, we now have a servant of the Lord who is like a Moses, who also has encountered God and his face shines like Moses' is did. Isn't this interesting how we have a similar story in the Book of Mormon? Abinadi, who also comes to the people, you have a bunch of priests who think that Abinadi is teaching falsehood and they want to kill him. And what happens? Abinadi also very serenely stands in front of this hostile crowd and he looks like an angel. His face shines with luster, just like Moses' did. And what does Abinadi teach? He teaches about Moses and what God taught the people about how to be covenantly loyal to him at Mount Sinai, which is what we're going to see Stephen does. That's right. The, the, the fascinating thing to me is, is that even seeing this outward sign, it doesn't, it doesn't change hearts. Yeah. It doesn't convince, it didn't convince King Noah and his priests, and it doesn't convince these people here. But hopefully, it helps strengthen our testimony when we can recognize God working through the lives and ministries of other people uh, through the power of the Holy Ghost. So now what happens, speaking of Moses, speak, speaking of these, these examples from the past, we watch as Stephen now opens up this beautiful history lesson for people who are of the synagogue, that they know their Old Testament well, and he's saying, let me, let me reteach you your history. And so he's going to put in here some of these characters that they know and love very well. So he begins with Abraham, then he goes to Joseph in Egypt, then he goes to their beloved lawgiver himself, Moses, that we've already addressed. And in each of these, he's telling a story for the purpose of teaching the doctrine of Christ. So he's not just reviewing a history lesson, he's showing them how if you look at these, these men's stories in the Old Testament through the lens of the Savior Jesus Christ, all of a sudden their story becomes really powerful with this covenantal connection with heaven, with God. So Abraham, he tells his story and all of the struggles that he went through and the trials of, of his life and how God reached out and gave this incredible covenant to him and all of these amazing promises all the way down through verse 8. Then you get into Joseph, the patriarch, and how verse 10, God delivered him out of all of his afflictions. So we saw Abraham's afflictions and how God delivered him. Now let's watch his uh, great-grandson, Joseph, um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, so we're down a great-grandson level from Abraham. I'm going to tie this into the Book of Mormon. Nephi, in the very first chapter, 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 20, says, I will show unto you that the tender mercies of the Lord are over all those whom he hath chosen because of their faith to make them mighty, even unto the power of deliverance. One of the key messages here is that the God we worship is a God of deliverance. He is a covenantal God. He has covenanted to provide salvation for us. It's freely offered, we saw this last year, through the Abrahamic covenant, and it is our choice to receive the free gift. And that's essentially what Stephen is trying to convince them of. God has offered this gift again and again, and it culminated, we'll see later in the chapter, with Jesus. And what did you guys do to the gift? You got rid of it. So the invitation for all of us is, we need to be freely receiving the gift that's freely offered. Now watch, now watch some of the beautiful symbolism that takes place here in, in this context, using Joseph as, as an example. Verse 11, now there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. The idea that you can look to the world for the ultimate solution, and you're not going to find it. it. It won't sustain you, it won't support you. So, when they heard that there was corn in Egypt or grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. So, the brothers go to Egypt, it saves the family, and then they didn't recognize him. 
They didn't know who he was. Their, their savior and redeemer was just some random Egyptian in charge. And notice what happens in verse 13, and at the second time Joseph was made known to his brethren. Here's Stephen who is looking at these Jews saying, you didn't recognize your Savior when he was with you the first time, but at his second coming, nobody will be able to not recognize him. Everyone, every knee is going to bow, in essence, uh, and confess who he is. And I love this fact that it was the second coming into Egypt when they recognize. oh, this is Joseph, our brother. And building on this, we know that Jesus is the bread of life. So this word corn really is about grain, and bread is a grain-based product. And so Joseph is the one who provides salvation through grain or bread, and Jesus is the bread of life. So we hope you can see that Stephen is very clearly teaching his fellow Jews Jesus is the one that you see symbolized by our ancient forefathers who comes to give us the bread of life and to save us. Then we get Moses also as a type of Christ with his life being laid out here. You'll notice 40 years, 40 years, 40 years keeps showing up in Moses' story. It represents this long period of time. So you see Moses' life in these segments, um, starting in verse 20, in which time Moses was born and was exceedingly fair and nursed up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nursed him for her own son, which is kind of a fun little part of the Bible, tells us what an amazing uh, money manager Pharaoh's daughter was, because she went down to the bank of the Nile and drew out a prophet. It's, it's really amazing how she did that. I, I actually love this phrase, exceeding fair. It turns out if you look carefully in the scriptures, sometimes that phrase is used to put a spotlight on, on a spiritual hero that's going to provide an example for us that points to Jesus. King David, when he was a young shepherd, was uh, described as exceeding fair. And how I think this is interesting to the Book of Mormon is Nephi's name in Egyptian means to be fair. And so Nephi also seems to be exemplifying that there's beauty and goodness in being aligned to God. So you can see this pattern throughout the scriptures as you look at the lives of God's chosen people. They're exceedingly fair, and not just in physical complexion, but it's more about that they have God's goodness with them. So now we jump into Moses' life, starting in verse 23. He's 40 years old when he goes out and he has the experience watching the, the Hebrew slaves. Then he goes out into the desert of Midian, and verse 30 tells you that he's 40 years there when he sees the burning bush, has the experience with God calling him to go in and bring the children of Israel out. Then in verse 36, he brought them out and he was in the wilderness with them 40 years, so it's 40, 40, 40, and unfortunately, it was easier for him, it seems, to pull the children of Israel out of Egypt than it was for him to help them remove Egypt from out of their heart. Verse 39, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt. It's a, lot, a little bit like Lot's wife. Exactly. They turn back their, their hearts. So this now brings us to the concluding part of his history lesson, where in 45 through 48 he's going to talk about David, their, their favorite king, we have their favorite lawgiver, we have their deliverer, and we have their, their patriarch, the, the, the beginning, the father of all the faithful. All of the important people are here, and then we get King Solomon, who built the temple in Jerusalem. Now, this is important to think about the temple, because the temple now is the most significant building in Jewish history, and Stephen is preaching not far from the temple. It is the religious epicenter for the Jewish people, and for them, they see it's the embodiment of this whole story. So if you want to physically embody the story of salvation that now Stephen has been talking them through, it is the temple. 
So Stephen wants them to see that what he's preaching to them is tied up in this building that they spend a lot of time at. And of course, this is where eventually they're going to get very upset with him about what he says about the temple itself. That's right. And, and in fact, there's a, there's a little verse in here that sometimes causes people some, some concern. Verse 48, it says, here's Stephen, speaking of the house that Solomon built, howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. And some say, wait a minute, because in the Old Testament he commands them to build the tabernacle and the temple wherein he may dwell, and here's Stephen saying he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Keep in mind, we're going to talk about this later on in the year when we get into the epistles of Paul. There are two Greek words that get both get translated into the English word temple. One is naos, the other is hiron. Hiron is the huge temple structure, the big buildings, and, and the, the, the temple of Solomon would be the Hiron. The sanctuary of the temple or a statue, an idol, a shrine, those are called a naos. And if you look in the Greek here, he's saying in verse 48, the Most High dwelleth not in this naos form of the word. You, you can't build an idol for him and sacrifice to him and have his spirit come and occupy the, that idol as the pagans believe with all of their idol worship. He's, he's pushing back against that, and he's also saying um, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Verse 49, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? And so then we shift gears into verse 51, and he focuses now on the men in that trial. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. And then he asks them, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one of whom ye have been now, the betrayers and murderers. Wow, he just, it, he increased the temperature in the room with this statement, and it says, uh, verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. They're, they can't take this. And then the famous verse 55, but Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. What did he see beyond just the two figures standing there? What did he see in the face of God the Father, in the countenance, in the eyes, in the look of Jesus Christ? This next set of verses tells me that he's looking a little deeper. Look at verse 56. Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God, then they cried with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran upon him with one accord, they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul." There's your first introduction to one of our most famous characters in all of the Bible, Saul, who later becomes Paul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So here's Stephen, while they're stoning him, he's calling upon God. Again, I think he's seeing more than just two people standing there. I think he's looking and seeing things reflected in their countenance and the glory emanating from them, and it says, he kneeled down and he cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge, and when he had said this, he fell asleep. I think he's seeing some, something from the Savior's piercing glance from his look that reflects love, mercy, grace, power, to the point where he's, he's ready to die, he's being killed, and he now finishes his life very similar to the way Jesus concluded his own. Forgiveness. With forgiveness and mercy. 
and grace, against people who, quite frankly, we'd like to see more justice on their head, but I think he's drawing upon his, his connection with the Lord to be able to pull this, this final statement out of the depths of his soul where in that moment he has become this beautiful symbol of Christ for us, which means it's a great story for Stephen. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult ending, this martyrdom, this stoning of Stephen, but he turned it into something beautiful, which makes me wonder, huh, could I learn something about injustice and how to endure major trial and suffering and opposition from Stephen as he is a reflection of Christ? So ultimately, can I, can I learn how to better go through life's trials and suffering by my study of these stories? And I think the answer is a resounding yes. In the ancient Jewish world, when somebody stood, it meant it was time for judgment. And what does Stephen say? I see God and his son standing. So remember, there's a council of judgment against Stephen, but Stephen actually has his own group who he's standing with them, with God and Jesus, who are now in judgment against these Jews who have rejected the freely offered gift of salvation. And so it is really compelling in that. And, and the Jews knew this. They recognized that they were under judgment, and yet they still enacted this heinous deed. And then it concludes with this incredible mercy that Stephen realizes they're being judged, and yet he wants mercy. So chapter 8 opens with Saul saying that he was consenting unto Stephen's death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. So you saw in the beginning chapters, the first seven chapters of the book of Acts, this growing, beautifully developing success of their missionary efforts, and now the opposition just mounts up and starts to try to push it uh, down and to suppress them. So there's this scattering that's going on. So uh, Saul, in verse 3, is making havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. So they're scattered abroad. Now we shift gears to Philip, one of the other seven that was called to assist the twelve. And he went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Well, this is interesting because most of the preaching has been in Jerusalem, and now we're moving to this new area. It's almost like we're letting the partial Jews, partial Gentiles in. To that's, the that's right. You remember what we called the thesis statement of the book of Acts back in uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that he told them they're going to receive power, you're going to be witnesses of me, in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and we've been doing that, now in Samaria and then in Paul's and beginning with Peter and then into Paul's missionary journeys unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So here we go into Samaria. You'll notice that when Philip starts preaching, the people in verse 6 came with one accord, giving heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles he did. And so you're, you're experiencing this wonderful success, well, once again, in your life, when you're moving forward trying to f receive, recognize, and act on that revelation, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden everything becomes easy. There is an opposition in all things. 2 Nephi 2.11 makes that very clear from Father Lehi, and you get the opposition rising up here, initially in verse 9, a certain man called Simon, he, which before time in the same city used sorcery. Or magic. He's a magician. And we should just say briefly, in the ancient world, magic was categorized as people who are trying to use power for their own individual purposes, for their own benefits. And, and so this is how we're setting him up, that Simon seems to try to be benefiting him, his own self originally. Absolutely. So the problem is, is now Philip's there, and people who used to be trusting the voice of Simon the sorcerer are now 
not attending his sessions anymore, not giving him glory and money, they're paying attention to, to Philip. So verse 12 says, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. So it's great. He's like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into this. So now he gets baptized. But he needs an education about how the gospel works. I think he spent so much time using power for his own purposes and benefit that he didn't realize how God's power is meant to be used. So the, the fascinating uh, element in this story is the apostles in Jerusalem heard about all the success in Samaria, so Peter and John leave Jerusalem, go up to Samaria, and they lay hands on these people in verse 17, and they received the Holy Ghost, which tells us that the seven apparently don't have the Melchizedek priesthood or the higher priesthood, but the Aaronic priesthood. So Philip was able to baptize a whole bunch of people, but he couldn't give them the gift of the Holy Ghost. So after Peter and John are able to bestow this gift of the Holy Ghost, Simon saw this happening, and he's thinking to himself, wow, the, the money and the gain I could get from this, so he, he offers to buy the power that Peter and John have so that he can do this. He's thinking, wow, I can do amazing wonders. In the ancient world, magicians sometimes would sell their secrets or powers to other magicians. Like, okay, well, you want you saw that I was successful, I will sell my secrets to you. So again, Simon seems to not be fully aware. He, he seems to believe, but still be so stuck in his old way of understanding the world through the magician's eyes that I have to buy power in order to use it, that he needs this pretty stern rebuke and instruction from Peter about how God's power is acquired and then deployed in the service of others. Don't you love this, that, that Peter's response to him, verse 22 says, repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee, for I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. This to me is a, a fascinating reality check that if I'm ever trying to get anything to gratify my own pride, my own desires, my own glory, then I'm not focused where I need to be, which is on God and on loving people. It's on what can I get from them to benefit me rather than, dear Father in heaven, what can I get from thee to be able to benefit them. How can I bless them? And that is what the power of the priesthood is, is it's the power of God that he bestows upon us in our callings, in our families, in different capacities of life, not to give ourselves blessings, not to, to gratify our own pride, our own desires. Or to hoard the blessings God has given us and just like, oh, that just proves I'm righteous, I'm going to hold on to that because the blessings are meant to be shared. Amen. And I love how the story ends, that here's Simon. We don't know how long he had practiced magic. He seems to believe. He seems to be stuck in this old magician's mindset. And after this stern apostolic rebuke, what does he do in verse 24? He says, and I think in humility, he says to Peter, pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. So I, I like to think that Simon learned, like we all do, grace by grace, and over time shed his old habits and old thinking, repented, changed his mind, and came to understand what God's power is really about. I love that. Now, uh, Peter and John return to Jerusalem, and keep in mind, we haven't had major success among the Samaritans. The last time that we had any even mention of, of teaching or working, ministering among the Samaritans was clear back in John chapter 4, Jesus with the Samaritan woman at the well, and then he spent uh, some days in the city with them preaching and had great success, but then we lose that story, that, that there's no carrying on of that work with those people. So, finally, we get a person a representative of the church going into Samaria among those people and having amazing success, and I don't know about you, but Taylor, if you were his mission president, 
and you've got a missionary who's finally having untold success in this area that previously has been kind of a dead area, my hunch is, is you wouldn't say, ooh, let's move him. But that's exactly what happens here. Have you ever struggled to, to make sense of revelation? that comes at times in a way that might call you to go somewhere or to do something different than what you're already doing, where maybe you have experienced success, maybe you've invested a lot of time, energy, and effort into a relationship or into a career or into a, an educational pursuit, and then the inspiration comes to go a different direction, and quite frankly it makes no sense because, look, I'm finally getting success here. Look at verse 26. The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. So, if you look at the, the simple map of the region, you get Jerusalem here, Nazareth up here, Samaria is this middle region here. This is where he's having all the success that we haven't experienced up to this point, and then the Lord sends him down to this desert place, Gaza. Desert implies… Deserted. Deserted. Not a lot of people. I can picture… I can picture the natural man tendencies within myself. I can't speak for Philip, but I can picture that natural man tendency saying, wait, what? You want you want me to leave? We finally have some success here, and I know it can grow, and you want me to leave this and go down to Gaza? I love Philip because he is so covenantally loyal to God that when the command comes, he's in this kind of relationship, I will be your God, you will be my people, and he's not trying to reverse that to say, Lord, not thy will, but mine be done, he's very beautifully following the Savior's example of saying, Lord, not my will, but thine be done, and I trust thee. Even though I don't know all the reasons, I, I, can't, see, I can't see the rationale or the logic behind this, I trust that you know exactly what I need to do, and he goes. I love this. Verse 27 says, and he arose and went. He doesn't seem to to argue or, or complain about this command, he just went. And now we get introduced to this man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, he had come to Jerusalem for to worship. So think about this for a minute. You've got a man who is on his way down to Ethiopia, down into Africa, We've had no mention of the gospel going down there. The, the furthest into Africa we get is Egypt, and then you get some stories of Cyrene, which is modern-day Libya, and we know that during these festival times of year, people from all over the region are flocking to Jerusalem uh, to, to, to keep these practices, and this eunuch is one of those. Whether he was born as a Jew or became a proselyte, which is to adopt Judaism, or whether he's a God-fearer. We don't know, we just know he came to Jerusalem and now he's on his way back home. And it's significant, he's reading from the book of Isaiah. you got to realize that anciently books were extremely expensive, they had to be hand-copied. So he, as we know, is the guardian of the treasure, treasury, so he apparently has some access to wealth that he can deploy to access scriptures. But the fact that he is a eunuch may mean that he is not allowed into certain forms of worship in Jerusalem. So it's significant that God would choose him, this educated, wealthy man who seems to be very humble and focused on trying to understand the will of God. And again, we don't know how the story, what happens to the eunuch after the fact, but I like to see him as this vanguard who takes the gospel back down into Ethiopia and helps those African nations find and experience Jesus. The other thing to consider here is in, in antiquity, the, the art of silent reading was not 
common. It was not known to them. If they're reading, they read aloud. Because partly they actually believed that the words spoken had power. How often do we think about invoking the name of Jesus Christ has power? The belief was similar for the words in Scripture. So he was reading out loud. He's reading out loud, and you see that verse 29 tells us, the Spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. Once again, here it is, this man, he's not saying, well, that would be weird. Who, who am I? This, this humble missionary, why would I go and stand next to this really important chariot carrying a really important person? He doesn't argue. The Lord guides him and he goes. Uh, he doesn't need a cattle prod shocking him or, or poking him to go forward. The Spirit whispers and he goes. I want to be more like Philip because he's reflecting an attribute of Christ, of this willing submission, humble, meek, willing to submit to all things which the Father seeth fit to inflict upon him, so to speak. I, I love this, this story. So he goes and he stands and he recognizes that he's reading, this, this eunuch is reading from the prophet of Isaiah, Esaias in the Greek, Isaiah in the Hebrew. And so he asks him the question, understandest what thou readest? And he said, how can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Ironically, which chapter does he happen to be reading in? Isaiah 53. Of all the chapters, the, the song of the suffering servant, this man who is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him, but by his stripes we are healed. He, he, the iniquity of us is laid upon him by the Lord, and through him we find life. And this eunuch is so confused from his worldview and his context, scripturally speaking, he's like, what is this talking about? And I love how Philip explains to him, verse 34, the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speakest the prophet of this, of himself or of some other man? And then Philip opened and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And then you get this fascinating conclusion to the story with the eunuch. Verse 36 says, as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And by the way, they're out in the desert. So it's not like water is just everywhere. This is, this is a, a for, could we call this coincidence or the hand of God? Yeah. Now, Verse 37 is interesting. If you look up biblehub.com and you come to Acts chapter 8 and look at verse 36, 37, 38 in Bible Hub, you'll see various 30 or so English translations. You'll notice that in many of them it tells you verse 37 is missing. Most of our original – not our original because we don't have any of the originals – most of our earliest copies and manuscripts of the New Testament so all of our oldest books, like uh, the, the Codex Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, and Alexandrinus, none of them have verse 37. It's missing. It doesn't start showing up until uh, centuries later, 5th or 6th century, when all of a sudden it, it shows up. It seems that a later copyist doesn't like how quickly this Ethiopian unit gets baptized, because all he says is, what doth hinder me to be baptized? There's water right there, and in verse, then it jumps straight to 38, and he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So apparently some copyist later on felt like, oh, that was a little too easy, we need to have some expression of faith here, so then somebody must have added verse 37, and Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Again, I guess it's possible it was in the original taken out and then reappeared centuries later, or the idea is, is that he's already demonstrated his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and now he's going to go and get baptized. And you're going to see as we get further into our New Testament story how quickly 
people do indeed get baptized when they, when they first believe, which to me is a beautiful sign of the power of that beginning, that link, that covenant connection with Christ to say you don't have to be perfect. You do have to have faith, repent of your sins, now get on the path, and then trust that he'll work with you in the process of time with the benefit of being able to partake of the sacrament every week, and not just renew those baptismal covenants that you made at the, at the beginning, but also make a new covenant every week that you want him to be your God, you want to be his people, and you're willing to do all things that he asks you to do, and to mourn with those that mourn, comfort those that stand in need of comfort, and stand a witness, as a witness of God at all times and all things and all places. It, it makes me think about the Tree of Life story in the Book of Mormon, where people immediately grasp hold of the rod. So, symbolically, let's call that getting baptized. I'm not saying that's what it is, but it's not like there's like, you gotta spend 20 years and go through all these hoops before you ever get to hold onto the rod. It's like, immediately, you can get on the path, and the path itself has a series of sequences of rituals and events that lead you closer to God. But I see what you're talking about here. There's no reason to put up obstacles in people's path when they're willing to demonstrate that they want to follow Jesus. What a powerful, uh, powerful manifestation of God's mercy that he allows us to be baptized. Some people say, why do I have to be baptized? It's like, that is the wrong question. It's, what can I possibly do to thank the Lord for this incredible gift of offering me this baptism or this sacrament rather than, Ugh, I have to go to church this Sunday. No, you don't. You're, God is not up in heaven saying, I I'm going to be hurt if you don't go to church. He gave us the opportunity to go to church because we've been hurt and because we've hurt others. It's this, it's this beautiful connecting point rather than a, than a painful commandment that we have to keep begrudgingly. That's, that's the wrong approach. So now, think about this. Think about this. You're, you're Philip. You've had incredible success in Samaria. Now you've been introduced to this guy who has amazing influence down in Ethiopia and possibly spreading out into other parts of Africa, and in my mind, if I'm Philip, I'm thinking, wow, now I know why God wanted me to come down here, and I'm going to go and I'm going to meet Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, and I'm going to be able to start the work there as well. So we've just come out of the baptism experience with this perhaps expectation of, let's go south, and verse 39 happens, and when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So we don't know the rest of the story, as Taylor said earlier, about what happens with the eunuch, but a seed was planted, a baptism was performed, this man's going to go home, and who knows what happens. But Philip is caught away by the Spirit, and he's going to work his way now north. To an area called uh, Ash, Ashdod, a little bit south of where Tel Aviv is today. And by the way, the, the Ethiopic Christian church is one of the earliest Christian churches on the planet, and they have very uh, powerful and interesting traditions about where they came from, where they emerged from, and often also have very ancient manuscripts of the New Testament that have been helpful to understand the New Testament traditions. It's beautiful. So he's stopping at Ashdod, and then he ends up at Caesarea. Uh, the capital of uh, Israel from the time of Herod up to about 600 AD. And then he won't come back into the story, Philip, until much later during Paul's return from his third missionary journey will be reintroduced to him. But I just have to say, Philip is one of, one of the unsung heroes for me from Scripture. Most people don't talk much about Philip. He gets one chapter, one story. But quite frankly, I, I want to be more like Philip because he, he models this Christ-like meekness and, and submissiveness that I want a lot more in my own life. <clears throat> so now let's jump over to chapter 9, and we pick up Saul's story again. Keep in mind, he's been breathing out these threatenings in Jerusalem and in Judea, but now, because there's been a scattering of the believers of that early 
church, he now gets letters, these could be considered arrest warrants from the, the high priest in Jerusalem, to go up to Damascus, which is up north in Syria. So the distance from Jerusalem up to Damascus is going to be, depending on the weather, depending on the speed of, of your traveling companions, and if you have animals to help you along the way, a week, week and a half, maybe two weeks. The point being, Saul has some time on the road to perhaps ponder and contemplate uh, what's happened. And remember, the last major experience from Saul's story was having people lay cloaks at Saul's feet as he authorizes and, and approves of the stoning of Stephen, and he saw Stephen's face, he saw Stephen's response to the stoning, and he heard his last words, lay not this sin at their charge. And it makes you wonder if as Saul's walking that long road, if the Spirit is helping him remember and replaying that experience again and again. We don't know, but here's, here's where we pick up the story, verse 3. As he journeyed and he came near Damascus, so we've gone almost all the way to where I want to get within my satchel, I have these letters, these, these names of people that I'm going to go and arrest and bring back bound to Jerusalem. It says, suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. The, the kentron, the, these sharpened sticks are the pricks, the, an ox goad. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, is it safe to say that if we were to give Saul this student of Gamaliel, this, this Pharisee at the head of his class who's on this journey, if we were to give him a, an exam on knowing about the Lord from the Old Testament, pretty safe to say he'd pass that exam with flying colors. Yeah. He knows a lot about God, but he doesn't know the Lord. The Lord speaking to him, appearing to him, and, and talking to him, speak, calling him by name, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He could answer all these questions about God, all the facts and the figures and the dates and the places, but he doesn't know him. And That's an invitation for us. We are invited to immerse ourselves in the Word of God because it helps us to know about Him so that we can know Him. We want to be able to see God in our lives, not simply read about how God was in other people's lives. That's powerful and empowering to see that in the past, people had God in their lives. They knew God. It's to remind us and encourage us that we too we should always not let scripture study be the end point of our worship, but a starting point of having direct personal encounters with our Heavenly Father. So, Taylor, that, that concept is perfectly tied in to verse 6, which, in my opinion, is such an amazing way to begin and end a scripture study or a church experience or a temple worship experience or a family home evening. Look at the words here in verse 6. He, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? You'll notice he shifts it away from just the cognitive, the, the intellectual, the thinking, learning exercise to putting his agency on the altar of the Lord saying, what do you want me to do? It's this faith that leads to action. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Just because he asked the question doesn't mean that, boom, here's your instant answer. The Lord gave him the next step, go into the city, and then I'll tell you. Well, keep in mind, it's going to be three days until there's 
any further direction. So he's going to be sitting in the city in blindness, in darkness for three days. Hmm. Now that sounds oddly familiar to King Lamoni, Lamoni's father. Um, the people in 3 Nephi 8, 9, and 10, this idea of when you're shifting from a life that is contrary to the Lord's will to uh, this path of discipleship, there seems to be this three days of darkness, three days of deep, intense suffering. Alma the Younger, when he had his vision, three days of this where, where it's almost as if the Lord is giving him, giving these people time to reflect on what this life is really all about and what they truly want in their connection with God and for their life moving forward. It says, uh, verse 7, the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man, in chapter 22, verse 9, when he's retelling the story later on, he says that the people who were with me, they saw a light, but they didn't hear a voice. And you'll notice here it says that they heard a voice, but saw no man. One of those has to be off, and Joseph Smith, in his translation, changed this one here to say, and they who were journeying with him saw indeed the light, and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him who spake to him, which to me implies this message was not for them. The, the voice was for Saul, and Saul alone, and he's the only one who got that message. So then verse 9 tells you he was three days without sight and did neither eat nor drink. Now watch the contrast. We go to verse 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, which, by the way, we don't know this for sure, but it's at least a possibility that one of the letters in Paul's satchel has the name Ananias, referring to him on it, this disciple in Damascus. So consider the, the irony here of the Lord now coming to Ananias in verse 10 saying, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. Do you see the beauty of how scriptures can, can set up these contrasts and comparisons? When Luke is writing this part of the story, you saw Paul or Saul, this Pharisee who knows so much about the Lord, who sees him, who art, who art thou, Lord? And then you get this other man named Ananias, and we know nothing about his background, his learning, his training, if he's literate or not. We don't know. But the Lord gives one word. Ananias, and the response wasn't, who is that? Who's talking to me? The response is, oh, I recognize that voice. Here am I, Lord, which is uh, this beautiful reflection of the Christ-like attribute of God saying, whom shall I send, and him saying, here am I, send me. It's it's that perspective that I also want to apply in my life from Ananias' example. And the Lord said to him, arise and go. Did you notice that Paul got the same two verbs in verse 6 from the Lord? Arise and go. But it's for a different purpose. You need to go and sit for three days in darkness. Ananias, I need you to arise and go into the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And at this point, Ananias is saying, Saul of Tarsus? Seriously? I, I know that name. He, he has wreaked havoc among, among the, the members of the church, and if he's blind, hallelujah, let's let him stay blind because then he can't hurt us anymore. And he, he's giving all of that rationale in verse uh, 13 and 14, and then notice verse 15. I love verse 15 because the Lord never seems to want to hold you and me nor Saul hostage to our past. He wants us to be able to continue to progress and develop. Look at verse 15, but the Lord said unto him, go thy way. Ananias, for he, Paul, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. 
you have this very unique individual. He was born a Roman citizen in Tarsus, up in southern Turkey of Cilicia. He's, he's, he knows the Greco-Roman culture and society. He is a devout Jew, a Pharisee, who has learned the Old Testament to a very deep level, and he knows the Hebrew, he knows the Aramaic, he knows the Greek, and he's energetic and fearless, and he's willing to do things that others may not want to do. He's a very unique he individual. He is perfectly positioned to be a chosen vessel, to be a minister and a witness for my name's sake. Verse 16, look, look at how he worded that. I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went his way, and he entered into the house, put his hands on him, and said, Brother Saul. Did you catch that? Mm. Brother Saul. Mm. Not enemy Saul, but brother Saul. The Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. I love that word, forthwith. That means immediately. And then another immediate word, uh, he received meat, then go down to verse 20, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God in the synagogues among the Jewish people. And now can you see the struggle that Saul's facing? Have you ever had a time when you felt love from God, when you felt forgiven from heaven, but there were natural consequences that lingered? Is it possible to actually be clean as far as the Lord is concerned and yet still have a price to pay with people and with relationships, that's where Saul finds himself. Right now he's in what you might call no man's land mm -hmm. because now the, Jew, the leaders of the Jews see him as a, a traitor, a turncoat. It's like we're, we're going to – he's now public enemy, number one, and the Christians aren't exactly going to welcome him in because they would see him as potentially a spy, like, yeah, sure, you're a believer. You just want to get in with us so you can find out who everybody is and, and what our roles are so that you can then condemn us. This poor guy is, is in this very difficult position. So when Saul was come to Jerusalem in verse 26, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and, he be and believed not that he was a disciple, but Barnabas – he took him, and he brought him to the apostles, and he declared unto him, unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Barnabas is, is a witness to say, yeah, it's genuine. The Lord appeared to him. He's, he's not a spy. He's not trying to trick us. But there's this struggle that takes place with people's trust. They, they just – they couldn't get over this. And so it looks like it's at this point where Paul takes a three-year hiatus, and he tells us about that in Galatians chapter 1, verse 18, where he spends three years away and then comes back um, to be with the apostle Peter. And that's where we get in verse 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all of Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified and walking in fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. So no longer do they have this threat from Paul yeah. or Saul. And now you get uh, a couple of miracles, significant miracles performed by Peter to close out chapter 9. The first one is where he heals a man who is sick of the palsy. He's paralyzed. His name is Aeneas. And notice the wording in verse 34, Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed, and he arose immediately. And then in verse 36, you get the story of Tabitha, also called Dorcas, woman full of good works and alms deed. She dies, and Peter, in verse 40, kneeled down and prayed and turned him to the body and said, Tabitha, arise, and she opened her eyes, and then she sat up. And verse 42 says, it was known throughout all Joppa, which is 
modern-day Tel Aviv in that area, and many believed in the Lord. And now Peter is staying at the house of Simon the Tanner there in Joppa, which prepares us for next week's lesson that begins with an amazing vision that Peter's going to have at the house of Simon the Tanner. So as we come to the close of this lesson this week, there, there have been fun stories that took place 2,000 years ago with, with people like Stephen and Philip and Saul and Ananias and Peter and Aeneas and Tabitha, but the fact is those are stories that took place 2,000 years ago, far away from where most of us live today. If we take our scripture study to the next level, the next depth of trying to connect with the Lord, perhaps we, like Saul, might give a heartfelt request, what would thou have me to do? How can I actually become more connected with the Lord? How can I trust him more? How can I put aside my will and embrace his more? Because I want him to be my God, and I want to be his son or his daughter, whatever applies. And as we move forward, just know that the Lord will reveal his will to us, and the more we act on that, the more natural it will become to hear the whisperings of the, of the Spirit and be on the Lord's errand rather than our own. Know that he lives, and we leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Know that you're loved. And spread light and goodness.